Under the hood, the Mark II is spacious, and everything is located very reasonably. In terms of serviceability, this is a very good car. The workmanship of any elements is excellent, and the resource of any unit is excellent by European standards. Let's down, as usual, the style of service, which I have already spoken about. As soon as something breaks, the element is not repaired, but they try to replace it entirely with the cheapest one from disassembly. The main thing is that without a run across Russia. As a result, wiring and brains and sensors and in general, anything can be collective farm. Particular attention in the case of inline sixes should be paid to the operation of the cooling system since long cylinder heads and blocks easily lead from overheating. The rest is Toyota, which means the most practical car. Not without nuances, of course. For example, all motors do not really like cold starts and are very sensitive to lambda errors, temperature sensors, and DBP due to the characteristics of control systems. Typical symptoms of the latter are increased consumption and poor traction. And even in this state, the motors will run to the last until the last sensor power driver in the brain burns out and the last drive from the TPS falls off. Since anything can turn out to be on the Mark II as a result of the swap, I'll say right away that we will consider only regular motors. All variants of the UZ, the good old just 1G FE and the old JZ are out of the question. Only 1G FE beams, 1JZ FSE, 1JZ GTE, and 1JZ GE VVTI, the latter was installed on Blit all-wheel drive station wagons. The 1G series of motors existed at Toyota for a very long time, and they replaced it with the JZ series. But the simplest version of the engine, naturally aspirated with conventional injection and a volume of 2.0 liters, was upgraded with the installation of an electronic throttle, separate ignition coils, a plastic intake manifold with adjustable geometry, and a new catalyst. At the same time, hydraulic lifters were removed, the abbreviation beams was added to the name, which means nothing less than breakthrough engine with advanced mechanism system. In general, the unit is breakthrough and with advanced mechanisms. In this form, the motor remained the base engine with a power of 160 horsepower for the Mark II and even the first generation Lexus IS. Basically, he is reminded of an unsuccessful air filter, a bend in the valves when the timing is broken, an oil burner, valve adjustment, and a weak oil pump. In terms of resource, the motor is neither fish nor fowl. On the one hand, his piston group is quite strong. There are examples of engines with very high mileage. But most of the units during our operation already after hundreds of thousands have a small oil consumption on the order of a liter or two from replacement to replacement, which by 200 to 300,000 runs turns into a share of a liter or two per thousand. For a cast iron straight six from Toyota, the performance is not very good. At first, the problem is coking oil scraper rings and leaking valve seals, but over time, the compression rings lie down, and the cylinder liners wear out, and the pistons. If you decoke in time with something lethal like Dimexide or BG-109, then repairs can be postponed for quite a long time. But while they don't bother so often, the price for these motors is low, it's easier to change to, of course, contract without a run in the Russian Federation, actually taken from a mark wound on a pole with a mileage of 360,000 at a disassembly in Podolsk. The 1G FE beams has some annoying features. The valves need to be adjusted every 20,000 kilometers, and they are regulated by pushers, which is not cheap, each costs 8 euros. The gap does not go away for everyone, but usually one or two valves have to be readjusted. The VVTI valve regularly wedges, as a result either idle ones take off or fall, or traction can improve dramatically at about 2000 RPM or fall at the top, the brakes can become very tight. The new valve serves about 100,000 kilometers, but only a select few buy it, it costs as much as 60 euros. Usually they take used ones, they serve up to 30 to 50,000, but they give them away almost for nothing. Recently, the valves have learned to clean, opening the flare with the replacement of sealing rings. And again, washing with the ubiquitous dimexide helps a little. An unsuccessful VCG system, in addition to being clogged, 
also tends to freeze in winter with oil being thrown out. In addition, it is implemented in a very old-fashioned way and fills the air filter with oil, which is sometimes very unpleasant. And the filter itself is not very good, there is a high chance of installing it crookedly, and the motor will suck sand. A clogged VCG means leaks, wet spark plug wells, wet timing belt, wet wiring. It is easy to leak through the oil pressure sensor. It requires regular monitoring. The timing belt runs stable 100,000 if you use high quality components. But the belt almost new, without a run in Russia for Toyota is the harsh truth of life. People stubbornly put used consumables, although it is no longer the 90s. The old belt breaks unpredictably, and the valves on this motor bend, usually 8 to 10 pieces at a time. Yes, and the valves themselves are unsuccessful, they cannot be edited, they crack along the edge if there is soot. And if it bends at speed, then the plate may fall off and pierce the piston. And there it is not far to the fist of friendship. Individual coils are quite strong, but do not like overheating, oil, and old candles. They are rarely bought new, still 60 euros. And when choosing either a used one for 6 euros or a new non-original, they usually prefer used ones. Luckily, replacement tips are available. And yes, candles are also sold secondhand. A small nuance is associated with the oil pump. It is driven by a timing belt and is designed well overall. But they often try to ignore the oil problem by filling in bad oil and increasing the replacement intervals. And this leads to early wear of the pump working group and pressure reducing valve wedges. And cheap mineral water puts a lot of pressure on a cold one through a rather weak pump seal directly onto the timing belt. Of course, all troubles do not happen at once, but in general the motor is noticeably more troublesome than all other 1G engines and even more modern ones. At the same time, it is not exactly worth a penny. Prices start at 400 euros for a unit with a good auction estimate. And one more unpleasant nuance. A car with this engine in city mode has a steady fuel consumption of 18 plus liters, often reaching 25 plus liters in winter. Considering that the dynamics of the 160 horsepower aspirated Mark II is very moderate, even taking into account its small mass, there are many dissatisfied. After all, a much more momentary and powerful Jay-Z eats the same amount or even less. Of course, part of this merit falls on a worn-out 4-speed automatic transmission with a poorly functioning gas turbine engine block, power system failures, unadjusted valves, old filters, but a lot also depends on the engine. The second most popular motor is the 1JZ FSE. A version of the classic straight six with direct injection, as Toyota owners like to call it, D4. The motor is interesting. Not least thanks to the fact that the solutions of the conventional 1JZ FE VVTI were complemented by a very simple direct injection system. There is even a vacuum fuel pressure regulator on the high pressure fuel pump, and the pump itself was installed like a distributor on vintage engines towering above the cylinder head cover in the center. Old Scoot in the design is larger than that of Beams. The cast aluminum intake with adjustable geometry has a damper drive that looks like it was taken from a ZIL-131. One-piece aluminum cups of candle wells. Fully collapsible EGR valve. Electromechanical throttle, kind of like a carburetor ozone. Wire clamps on the intake manifold. The injectors are located openly, like on old diesel engines, and are secured in the same way. And a timing belt with a belt made of HNBR oil-resistant hydrogenated nitrile butadiene rubber in a sealed casing. The exhaust manifold is steel, with two equally long branches. In general, the motor is excellent in every way. The only pity is that the price of a live contractor is gradually approaching 1,200 euros, and for very intelligent specimens it has long exceeded this line. However, the regular 1JZ GE is noticeably more expensive, and there are very few survivors left. Little by little, motors from cars that are rare even in Japan, such as Toyota Progress and other oddities, are starting to get out, which are slightly different from the most popular mark, Crown, etc. Jay-Z, they won't be able to live without contractors. Of the minuses of the 1JZ FSE, 
only the hard sound of operation, sensitivity to the octane number of gasoline, coking of the exhaust valves, and the intake as a whole can be noted every 50 to 80,000 kilometers. Well, the resource of the piston group is somewhat less than that of the classic JZ due to more obvious coking of the upper compression ring and the constant presence of hard deposits in the combustion chamber. In general, if you regularly carry out deco king with water and treatment from soot, then only expensive and very fragile direct injection nozzles will remain from the troubles, and the need to do maintenance for high pressure fuel pumps every 100,000. A weak pump, a VVTI wedging valve, a weak viscous coupling and fittings falling out of the cylinder head are the same as in the 1JZGE in the VVTI version. It's just that even excellent motors have their drawbacks and weaknesses. But this engine has significantly lower fuel consumption, so far everything is in order, and even with the ancient 4 mortar in Moscow, it can drop to 13 to 14 liters and usually does not rise above 16. Let me remind you, for a weaker 2.0 engine on the Mark II this is practically the minimum cost. And, of course, the classic 1JZGE and 1JZGTE are found on the Mark II. The first is generally without everything, and in fact, in the last paragraph of the description of the FSE version, all problems are described. With runs up to 400 to 500, it has a zero oil burner and is afraid of little at all, except for overheating and bad oil. And the second is a turbo version of this indestructible motor. Powerful and with good potential for tuning, which most owners greatly overestimate. Even in stock it is much more sensitive than an aspirated engine to the quality of service and loads. But without much expense it allows you to achieve 350 to 400 horsepower. Further investments will be significant, but still this is one of the best options if you set a goal of 500 plus. But popularity also has a downside. Live engines have long been lacking, the price goes off scale even for options in a mediocre condition, but they put them with enviable regularity, once again indignant that the stand gave a load or the gasoline was not the same or somehow they are trying to justify that fact that crooked hands, careless assembly, and crooked firmware can kill even a very successful engine if you tune it up to about 500 horsepower. But I think if you are looking for a brand with this motor, then you hope that everything will be fine with you, and you are aware of the prices. The fact that the brakes on Toyota cars are weak is no secret. Here in Mark II does not differ in excessive performance of brake mechanisms. 275mm wheels seem rather weak for a car with a 160 horsepower engine. Even on the budget Opel Vectra B of the late 90s with a 2.0 engine, the rotors were 286mm. But there is a nuance, a typical Mark II with a 2-liter engine weighs 1,375 kilograms in the base, and the Opel weighs 150 kilograms more, although it is weaker, only 136 horsepower. However, in practice it is not recommended to drive any of these cars too actively. It is extremely unpleasant that on cars with a 1JZ FSE 2.5, 200 horsepower engine, the brakes will be exactly the same, and only with a supercharged 2.51 JZ GTE 280 horsepower, rely on as many as 296 mm rotors. Given the dynamic style of operation, the resource of the brake mechanism simply cannot be too large. Yes, and they don't take care of them, since the choice of contract, and if in human language, then simply use discs and calipers is huge, and their price is very low. European owners now better not to read. On the Mark II, you can even buy used brake pads with real imperial quality and without a run in Russia. And there is demand. Brake pipes are also often changed to used ones, but such perfectionism is gradually fading away. Still, non-original copper pipes are cheaper and more reliable, and the original ones last 10 years before the first fistulas appear. Otherwise, the brakes are excellent, everything is done intelligently, the calipers are simple, even on the top-end IRV the front ones are practical two-piston ones with a floating caliper. With minimal maintenance, they last forever, but they are usually not serviced, like the entire car, since replacing with freshly imported used ones is cheaper than any meaningful work. In this regard, the brakes and suspension of the car are a good indicator of the owner's approach to maintenance. 
The typical Far Eastern style, when any work with the head and hands is denied is too stressful, since it's cheaper to stick something from the auction ultimately turns Mark into a Frankenstein. A typical car from 2021 looks like this. The ABS sensors are turned from Corolla, the wheels are from Crown in an old body, but the ball ones are new, since used ones from the 110s were dismantled by the owners of the 90s and 100s as an upgrade. Of the serious disadvantages, one can name a crooked ABS with frankly non-livable sensors and weak wiring. For most owners, this is unpleasant, but not fatal. Problems begin with owners of rare options, such as Blit all-wheel drive station wagons. Since Toyota puts the brake rotors the same almost everywhere, but the hubs and sensors are different everywhere. And the price of a new original may surprise even those accustomed to expensive European premium consumption, they can ask for a sensor for both 150 and 250 euros. The suspension of the Mark II is not bad, strong and comfortable. It is a pity that the front strut and rear stabilizer are put only on top versions with supercharged engines. With a frankly weak engine shield and subframe, combined with not the best chassis geometry, these two elements fundamentally affect the overall feel of the car. Many brands have heavily modified suspensions for two reasons. Someone wants more sport and installs tuning kits, since there are many of them new and used. For Markov, they make levers, bolts, spacers, and similar elements even with us, and even the imported assortment defies description. Any element of the front or rear suspension is in the tuning version, from the spring to the ball. The second reason for the alterations is more commonplace. And this is the already mentioned desire to shove cheaper used cars into the car, and not repair the old one. So do not be surprised if you suddenly see obviously non-standard subframes set through elongated bolts and spacers with overcooking of mounting points. You need to run away from such a machine, they could not have altered it there. At the same time, consumables for the suspension are available and relatively inexpensive. The only pity is that everything turns sour terribly even in regions where cars as a whole do not rot. It is not at all a fact that the rear ball joints, they are also floating silent blocks, can be replaced quickly and easily. Most likely, you can't do without a grinder, a gas burner, a sledgehammer, and a pneumatic hammer. Bolts are almost always sawn, and levers often get it. That is why the hub is often changed from behind instead of replacing the silent block and bearing, or simply the entire suspension on the subframe along with the rear gearbox. Fortunately, the kit can be found for ridiculous 50 to 120 euros. Are you expecting something about the resource? It is almost impossible to determine it. There are no dealer cars, average mileage is 300 plus, everything is repaired with used spare parts in bulk. So regular complaints about the need to replace hubs, silent blocks in the rear suspension and balls in the front may simply be a consequence of repairs postponed until the last minute, successful quiet operation of the suspension even in a damaged state, and the use of bearings that had been lying in storage in inappropriate conditions. The main thing is to make sure when purchasing that there is no collective farm, and restoring it to stock condition will not cost much. Unless the rail for Turbo JZX110 with a pressure regulator costs some tangible money, but from Crown JZS171 they are three times cheaper and fully compatible. Serious negativity is associated mainly with two points. Over time, the rail begins to bite as the body wears out. At the same time, it does not flow and does not knock. And secondhand ones often flow through the seals immediately, since they were stored without oil. In any case, the overall service life of cart-in shafts and CV joints is high, and the cost of replacement is low. Used ones from Japan are usually very inexpensive, 80 euros for a cart-in, 40 euros for a drive, quite typical prices. Of course, immediately and now it will be more expensive, but not so much as to sound the alarm. Yes, and everything is being repaired in general well. The rear gearbox is quite strong, and oil leakage due to wear of the seals usually does not immediately lead to failure. The price of the part is again low, many have a welding for the winter or for drifting and a normal live one for summer rides. But self-locking ones with torsen and with conventional LSD locking are also valued. 
there is also a choice of tuning. The price of these can reach up to a third of the price of a still running car. So brewing tightly is the choice of a typical JDM chickpea brand, especially in regions with snowy winters. Because with a conventional differential, the car has no cross-country ability, and any self-block is several times more expensive. It is unlikely that you will be able to find Mark II on a mechanic by chance. It's trivial because the R154 manual transmission is a rarity, and, due to this rarity, very expensive. The price of an original used one is now more than 1,600 euros. The set from the 80th body is cheaper, but also not a penny. W58 slash W60 gearboxes are also not cheap, as are flywheels. It is often practiced to install old Gitrag 260-265-ZF320-GS6-45DZ slash slash from BMW with an overcooked bell housing, because even such troubles are cheaper than searching for an original manual transmission on a JZ, and besides, European boxes are almost increasingly stronger. Standard manual transmission was installed only on JZ X 110 AE MVZ with one JZ GTE until 2004. Such a machine itself is an indescribable rarity, usually already having little in common with the factory equipment. A typical Mark II is fitted with a good old 4 speed Eisen AW03 72, aka Eisen A44 DL. This is truly a legendary box that can handle everything and a little more. If the oil is changed at least once every 60 to 80,000 and the engine is not turbocharged, then the machine will withstand 500 plus thousand mileage. Previously, unless the blocking of the gas turbine engine ends, the speed sensor fails or the solenoid fails. With an average price of a contract box of 50 euros, they don't want to bother with repairs especially. Although the number of quality used ones has been declining over the past few years, and people are gradually starting to repair. Rare cars with one JZ GTE and tuning ones are equipped with an even stronger automatic transmission Eisen A343E, also known as AW30-70LE. Why stronger? Because it can withstand tuned one JZ GTE engines without any problems for several hundred thousand kilometers. And with stock ones, the same 500 plus passes. Prices for used versions are higher than for AW03-72, but not critical. The transfer case and front gear are strong and cheap enough not to be remembered at all. Is that in the context of disabling front wheel drive for drifting? The easiest way to do this is to turn off one of the ABS sensors, although the smartest guess that instead, you can cut off the power to the AWD unit or the signal from the ABS to it. It is more reliable, and ABS is not superfluous in winter. And, like other systems with torque on demand, the main problems are related to sensor failures of the same ABS and wiring. The bulk of the cars look quite cheerful, especially if you buy them in the traditional habitats of the Marks in the south or in Siberia. If you buy a St. Petersburg or Moscow car, then the chances of a problem body are quite high. Rotten sills, front fenders, windshield frame along the upper edge, rear arches, doors. All these places are well known to all experienced owners, rust most often crawls out there but it is unlikely that you will find a car for sale that looks very rotten. The reason is simple. Colored doors, hoods and fenders, as well as cut-off noses and cut-off quarters on the 110 body Mark II are still very inexpensive, making it relatively inexpensive to keep the car looking alive. The real state of the body can only be understood by evaluating the thresholds, windshield frame and internal cavities. Thresholds are often thrown on the outside with putty and filled with anti-gravity, sometimes overcooked with a typical Markov method, with a cut from the edge of the rear arch. The shape of the native part is quite intricate, cutting it as it should is a chore, you would have to disassemble half of the body. They rot mostly from the inside. Dirt accumulates, starting from the rear, the aft part of the threshold amplifier suffers greatly, it may simply be missing half its height. The reason is rather weak metal and not the best choice of ventilation system, with end caps. For a competent owner, the threshold is spilled with anti-corrosive, and corrosion will go slowly, but the car has long went to the people. 
the bulk of the Markovods are not very versed in the nuances of anti-corrosion treatment and successfully bring the car to overcooking. Corrosion of the upper seam of the windshield frame is treated by drilling out the roof panel, which is not very cheap, although the panels themselves are still available. The front fenders are peeling off at the junction with the headlight and bumper, and the edge of the arch is rotting from the inside. But the main problem with them is the rotting fastener ears. On lowered cars, the wing is generally a consumable item. Owners of Sten's marks are the main consumers of wings, and many ordinary owners do not like them for that reason. Which is not surprising, for a normal owner, a set of sawed-off wings lasts about three to five years, while for a stencer it lasts a season or less. The doors are gradually peeling off along the lower edge, and the frame on top sometimes swells, but in general they hold up well, and changing attachments is not a problem. But the rear arches do not hold up well, but with timely touch-ups, everything will be fine. Well-maintained cars do not have internal foci of corrosion, but if the arch is rolled out on the outside and the inside is damaged, then most likely the owner knew what he was doing. Still on marks there are often plastic body kits, both original and replicas. Alas, even the factory plastics are fixed SOSO, and the collective farm ones are even worse. Naturally, it is impossible to determine the state of the thresholds without removing it, which makes diagnostics difficult. Often under the plastic, everything is bad. And, of course, you need to understand that almost all marks are broken. The drive is rear-wheel drive, the motors are powerful, the ESP is often faulty, for example, as a result of a not-so-successful engine change, and the body parts are inexpensive. Unfortunately, even low-power modifications with a 2-liter engine are at risk. But the good news is that car accident recovery isn't always bad. Still marks, as many know, are designers and cuts. Being well aware of the Far Eastern import traditions, the inspectors at the MREO know where to look and how to check. We will not go into details and the difference between various categories of illegally imported cars here. Just know that at best you will be registered through the courts, and at worst a criminal case. Therefore, it is better not only to carefully study the TCP, but also to agree on the transfer of money to the seller after the car has been inspected by the traffic police. Apart from the already mentioned thresholds, there are usually no big problems. The trouble with the rotted inner body arch mainly concerns stencer cars or very neglected specimens, and by and large it is not so expensive to treat. Iron costs a penny, and collective farm brewing will not cost much. Basically, the bottom body is usually quite lively, with corrosion only at the seams, especially in the rear, at the subframe attachment points, with corrosion of the rear subframe itself and poorly ventilated areas in front of the rear axle and in bumpers. The TV also suffers, the front panel of the body, which most often gets damaged in minor accidents. At the same time, you can often find damage at the junction of the inner arch of the front wheel and the mudguard of the engine compartment. The seam depressurizes relatively easily and slowly, but surely rots. Depressurization of the seam of the upper reinforcement spar at the junction with the A-pillar of the roof is an unpleasant thing, but often it can be done without visible corrosion, you just need to reapply the sealant. But it's better to clean it and don't forget to fill the internal cavities with anti-corrosive. Surface corrosion of the front suspension cups and rear shock absorber mounts is also not uncommon, but they are unlikely to pose a threat to the integrity of the body. Nevertheless, the body is well thought out, except for the thresholds there are no elements that accumulate dirt and rot quickly. It is also well painted, chips and corrosion along the edges are rare, rot usually appears from joints and seams. This is not to say that the Mark II is absolutely perfect. He and the headlights are sandblasted very well because the plastic is very soft and the bumper mounts are by no means eternal and the brittle brackets under the headlights sometimes have to be changed and the moldings delaminate over time. But all these details change elementarily. There are a lot of them in any form and condition during the analysis. Owners often change lives to live simply because they want to freshen up the look, picked up the body kit elements of the new series, etc. Despite their age, the interiors hold up well thanks to the high quality of materials, plastic, leather, and fabric. 
Perfectionists will name a bunch of elements that have to change over time. For example, the dashboard glass, the block of trunk and fuel filler opening levers, power window buttons, door sills, climate control buttons, and center console trim around the automatic transmission lever. Most people usually don't notice such little things, although if you want, as has already been said, you can find literally everything on mark and inexpensively. Resource champions are dark fabric salons. Light leather looks rich, but lose and wear resistance. After 15 to 20 years, such a salon usually requires high quality dry cleaning with washing the door card coating, all linings and cracks and cleaning, ironing and tinting the seats. The skin itself is rough and strong, but the paint peels off in narrow strips in the places of bends, exposing a darker base, and crumbles in loaded places. In a fit of fanaticism, you can generally buy a Velayer complete interior from the top-end IRV configuration. Now they are asking for about 400 euros for a variant in good condition. I would like to say that everything is very reliable, but the resource of many elements is finite. For example, the electric drives of the driver's seat wear out the Japanese are very fond of the comfortable entry option, but they don't want to install powerful drives. Power window drives can creak or even fail. Or, for example, climate control damper actuators wear out in the same way as on European cars. True, the other extreme in servicing Japanese cars often comes out here. They can try to replace the stove as a whole, just not to remove the penny drives. With the disassembly of the interior, the removal of the transverse pipe, etc. It is more difficult to buy damper actuators separately than a complete stove block. Another argument in favor of a large-scale intervention will be the pollution of the stove radiator. It is often clogged and does not really work. At the same time, flushing is possible, but this is a long time, the service often changes to a new or used one. By the way, if only the radiator block is changed, without tubes, then the tubes are rolled in place with the simplest means, for example, with a screwdriver and a hammer. As you can imagine, this is not very reliable. Like, say, a completely replaced door, if only not to remove the glass, with wire connections on twists. The electrician, if there were no large-scale updates, does not cause serious problems. But since machines, as already mentioned, are usually repaired with large block implementations, there are a lot of problems. For example, an incorrectly selected braid when installing the Multivision onboard multimedia system can lead to a failure of the climate control system, dashboard, and more. Even an aftermarket radio can create problems. Connoisseurs of the model know about the legendary 120 ohm resistor, which sometimes needs to be changed because it burns out. The climate control unit comes in several versions. For some reason, the one with the swing function is appreciated changing the direction of the airflow. According to legend, it has more reliable buttons and fewer glitches. In general, if the hands of the servicemen were fairly straight and the selection of parts from the cup was correct, then there should not be any big problems. Well, if they repaired it somehow, by typing, then the result is natural. The collective farm style of maintenance is the bane of any car, especially those aged 10 years or more. For the Mark II, this is even more relevant due to partial, but not complete, compatibility with other Toyota models and the rich supply of used parts. As a result, it turns out that a very structurally good car in most cases will turn out to be unsuitable for normal use and without a chance of being restored to stock due to the depth of the alterations. But if you are lucky enough to find a car that has not yet been turned into a patchwork quilt of pieces collected from garbage dumps, then take it without a doubt. The consumer properties are more than decent, the price of quality service is low, and you can potentially drive for another 10 years.